Well, folks, uh, shalom to each and every one of you. My name is Michael Samuel Smith. Uh, I'll be your host today. We'll be doing uh, actually two live streams. This is the first of two live streams that we'll be doing here at Southwest Radio Church. So we're coming to you this morning from Oklahoma City. And again, I'd like to thank Southwest Radio Church for giving me the invitation to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to start off with a, a quick prayer if you will join me. Father in heaven, may you look down upon our teaching today and give us wisdom and an anointing that those that hear these revelations will see Jesus in all of it. And may you, Lord, get the glory for all of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, folks, our theme today is why we believe Jesus the Messiah will return in this generation. You know, people often ask me questions like, are there hidden messages in the Bible? Well, actually, there's a lot of them. Uh, but there's a reason why God put them there, and it's us to find those things out. Uh, so what would you say if I told you that the rapture, the seven-year tribulation, and the millennial kingdom are all incorporated in the Noah's Ark story? So I have one qualifying question to ask you before we get into our program. How many people survived the flood? So with that, uh, I'm going to go to my poster board and show you a couple scriptures that I think will help you with prophecy. Well, folks, uh, here's some keys to prophecy. I think you'll enjoy hearing this, and I believe it's going to help you as you study prophecy in the Bible. To start with, Isaiah chapter 41, verse 22 tells us uh, to let them bring forth uh, and show us what shall happen. Let them show the former things, what they be, that we may consider them and know the latter of them or declare us things to come. Well, what does that mean? Well, what it's telling us is that there are stories in the Bible, you're going to see types and shadows of them again. That's what that's saying. In our next scripture is Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. I'd like you to home in on that. Declaring the end from the beginning. And from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. So, uh, declaring the end from the beginning. The way I interpret that, uh, God is showing the book of Revelation in Genesis, showing the end from the beginning. Okay, here's another scripture about prophecy. Second uh, Peter 3 and 8 says, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is to one day. Again, we're talking about things in the prophetic plane. So one day can actually mean a thousand years in some biblical stories. Psalm 90 verse 4 tells us, For a thousand years in thy sight are but yesterday when it is past, and as a watch in the night. Meaning that when you hear the word a watch, it could prophetically allude to a thousand years. Okay, last but not least on my poster board presentation, Proverbs 25 and 2 tells us, It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, but the honor of kings is to search out a matter. You know, I've had some people tell me, uh, sharing some prophecy stories in, in the past, and they said, uh, well, we're not kings. Well, actually, we are. And the Bible tells us in Revelation 1 and 6 and Revelation 5 and 10, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So, again, God is concealing things in the Bible, and in some cases there's hidden messages uh, that God is showing his hand for us to learn. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. Well, folks, in our first story, I'll be talking about the Noah's Ark story. I, and I asked the question earlier, how many people do you think survived in the flood? I'd like you to hold that in your mind, if you will. As we look at Genesis, the book of Genesis, uh, the Ark story is found in chapter 6, 7, and 8. Now, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3 is actually a parenthetical statement. It says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, 
for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Make note of that, uh, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Well, uh, personally, I, I believe this parenthetical statement is not that it took Noah 120 years to build the ark. As a matter of fact, that statement has nothing to do with the ark. But I do believe what God is showing us is He's telling us that he is going to strive with man 120 jubilees. So uh, most of you know a jubilee is 50 years. And I believe, uh, if we look at this gold key here for a moment, uh, I'm sharing with you a key that opens up the answers to a lot of prophecy. So 120 jubilees is 6,000 years. Keep that in the back of your minds. Okay, so... Uh, now, the dimensions of the ark, it says in the Bible, uh, Genesis 6.15, that the ark is 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, 30 cubits high. Is there a meaning in that? Yes, there's a meaning in that. Number 300 is the number of faithful witness. Number 50 is the number of jubilee. And number 30 is the number of consecration. So all those things mean things. You know, when a baby, I was told the medical community many years ago used to teach there were 300 bones in a normal human baby when it's born. And of course, as that baby gets older and, the, and some of the bones in the head start to fuse, uh, that number becomes somewhat less. But, but they used to teach that, 300. And isn't that amazing? And of course, uh, 300 is a, a matter of faithful witness as well. So Genesis 6.14 discusses where God told Noah to put pitch in the ark. Now, if you think about it for a moment, if he built the ark out of wood, out of gopher wood, and he didn't put the pitch in it, the boat would sink. I mean, that's, that's obvious. But did you know that word uh, that's used for pitch is kafar in Hebrew, and it has three meanings, and one of the meanings is atonement. And I do believe that was the prophetic message that God is showing us in that story. Genesis chapter 5, verse 27, uh, lets us know that Methuselah lived 969 years. The oldest man who ever lived, right? Well, not exactly. But did you know his father lived to be older than him? Now, who was his father? Well, actually, his father was Enoch. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, and Enoch never died. So technically, how many people survived the flood? Uh, I say nine. Of course, we have Noah, Mrs. Noah, the three sons, the three wives, and Enoch. So where is Enoch? Well, Enoch's in heaven. And this whole type and shadow thing about the ark and the flood is a type and shadow of the tribulation. So I'll ask the question, where are you going to be during the tribulation? Are you going to be in heaven like Enoch? Well, certainly we want to be. But... Uh, Anyway, I just wanted you to be thinking about that. So Genesis chapter 5, verse 32 uh, tells us that Noah had three sons when he was 500 years old. Well, what does that mean? Well, I believe it means he had triplets. In the 500th year, in one year, he had three children. So if that's true, and I do believe it is, that means the future DNA of all of mankind is actually incorporated into Noah and his three sons. Food for thought. Genesis 7 and 6, Noah was 600 years old when the flood took place. And his sons were 100 years old when the flood happened. You know, we, we believe his sons helped them to build a boat. Well, what's that mean, Brother Mike? It means that it took 100 years or less to build the boat. The flood happened when Methuselah was 969 years old and he died. So his death was a sign of the coming flood. And as a matter of fact, uh, his name, Methuselah, means when he dies, it shall happen. And that's pointing to the flood. So let's talk about the door to the ark. Well, the Bible tells us that the Lord shut the door, right? Uh, and I'm in chapter 7, verse 16 of Genesis. So who was the Lord? Well, I believe it was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ who shut that door. You know, he is the door. He represents a door, too. And when that door to Noah's Ark shut, there was no way that you could get in. Did you know that's a type and shadow of the rapture, my friend? 
when that door shuts in this generation, you are either in the boat or you're not in the boat. I don't know about you, but I want to be in the boat, and I want you to be in the boat too. Okay, so by the seventh day of rain, the water covered the entire earth, and all the wicked were dead. But it rained 40 days and 40 nights. Here's my little key, 40 days and 40 nights. How many times have you seen 40 days, 40 nights in the Bible? I want you to take that number 40 times the Jubilee effect number 50, and what do you get? 50 times 40 is 2,000. Is this a type and shadow, this 40 days, 40 night type and shadow of 2,000 years before the rapture? I believe that it is. The waters prevailed upon the earth for 150 days. It says that in Genesis chapter 7, verse 24. So the people of the earth during the tribulation will also, there's going to be people being tormented during the tribulation, right? And, it, and we learn in the Bible, uh, chapter 9 of Revelation, people are going to be tormented for or five months, and which, by the way, equa equips to, e equates to 150 days. Food for thought. I'm in Gen uh, Genesis chapter 8. And after 150 days, the waters were abated, and the ark rested in the seventh month and on the 17th day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. Genesis 8 and 4, uh, make a note of that, the date of that. Uh, Genesis 8 and 4, the seventh month and the 17th of the month, one of the greatest mysteries in the Bible. Well, folks, I want to show this to you so you can literally see the meaning. Uh, I had mentioned that Genesis chapter 8, verse 4, is one of the greatest mysteries in the Bible, and it deals with the Noah's Ark story. So what's the big deal? Well, the Bible tells us that the ark had touched down on the 17th day of the month and the seventh month, okay? So what does that mean? Well, now, the seventh month is generally September, October. In the Passover month, the beginning of God's calendar year, even though there's 12 months in a year, is March, April, the Passover month. That's called Nisan. I put Nisan over here on the chart. There's a reason why I did that, because God actually changes the calendar. I don't know if you knew this. Uh, you know the civil calendar in Israel, uh, uh, which is Feast of Trumpets, which is Rosh Hashanah, is always in September or October, right, in the fall on your calendar. But God changed the calendar in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2. And I'm going to paraphrase this. He's telling us your seventh month is now your first month, meaning the seventh month is now... It now equates to Nisan, March, or April. So God has a different calendar for the very first time. Well, what's the big deal with that? Well, uh, the seventh month is now the beginning of months, Nisan. It's actually the month of Passover. So this is what I want to point out. Uh, we're going to make believe this is March or April, the year that Jesus died on the cross. My personal opinion, I believe Jesus died on the cross uh, in the year 30 A.D., not 31 or 32 or 33. People could argue that, and, and they're welcome to their opinion. Uh, but no matter how you look at it, we know Jesus dies on the cross on the 14th of Nisan, which is Passover. Passover is always the first full moon of spring, in case you did not know that. But there's some things that have to, we have to do to make things fit, and that is Passover could be any day of the week from year to year. But it just so happened that the year that Jesus dies on the cross, it was on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Now, scholars say it could be Wednesday or Thursday. For sure it's not Friday. Why? Because we know he, Jesus is going to be in the grave for three days and three nights, correct, before the resurrection and he will be resurrected on Sunday. So, uh, so now, remember back to Noah, the 17th day of the month, but now that month is Nisan. Now that month is the springtime, the Passover month. So what's the big deal? Well, here's the big deal. If Nisan 14, which is Passover every year and it's a full moon, it, it has to work out where it's three days later that Resur Resurrection Sunday is going to take place. And it did. So here we are. One, two, three. It's the 17th of Nisan. Did you all get that? 
The 17th of Nisan that year just happened to fall on a Sunday. So the 17th day, what's the big picture? The big picture in Noah's Ark, when it touches down, it's the same calendar day that Jesus arose from the dead. Now, my friend, that's the last day of Revelation. And I believe that's from the Holy Spirit, but I, but I wanted you to get that. So technically, uh, people call this Easter, but actually, it's really the Feast of first fruits. There's seven feasts that God has in Leviticus chapter 23. Now, in Acts chapter 12, verse 4, it actually mentions the word Easter in your King James Bible. It's referring to the pagan holiday uh, that was celebrated throughout the pagan world. So, and how do they celebrate that day uh, with Easter eggs and rabbits? It was all about fertility. Uh, do we see that today? It, is the Lord pleased with that? Well, that's why a lot of us like to refer to the Resurrection Day as the Feast of First Fruits. So uh, I, hope, uh, I hope that you enjoy that. Now, I have one other thing I wanted to point out about Noah's, uh, Noah's sign, that God had left a sign with Noah. There was a bow in the sky, okay? And, uh, and by the way, uh, I, I believe it's the Revelation 3 and 4 or 4 and 3 where it talks about the throne of God and there's a rainbow there. Did you know there's a rainbow there? And the rainbow is actually a 360 degree rainbow. So what I wanted to point out to you is God's rainbow has seven colors. I listed all seven here. Number seven is the number of perfection. It's also the number of completion. Well, the LGBT crowd, they decided they didn't like this, so they decided they're going to do their own flag. Now, there is an official LBGT flag or gay flag that doesn't have seven colors. It has six. Six is the number of a man. And I listed them here, but Houston, we have a problem. And the problem is it's missing one of the colors in God's rainbow. What color was it? It was indigo. I wanted you to know the color indigo is not found on, on their flag. Indigo is the color of royalty and spiritual knowledge. Indigo is missing the missing color in the LGBT flag. This was because it was intentional uh, that they lack the desire to connect with God. And I, and I wanted you to know that. Well, folks, Genesis chapter 8, verse 6 tells us, after 40 days that the ark touches down, Noah sends out a raven. Uh, Genesis 8, verse 7, uh, uh, 40 days. Now, you have to ask the question, uh, number one, why does he send a raven out? The first bird that he sends out is a raven. We know there's going to be a raven and a dove. But the other question is, but why 40 days? Here's my jubilee effect key if we... Insert 50, which represents a jubilee, times 40, we get 2,000. Is it conceivably possible that the raven is going to show up after 40 days, after 2,000 years? Okay. Uh, so I believe that the raven represents the Antichrist who comes after the rapture. Okay. So now, Brother Mike, uh, that's a little over the top, but why do you say that the raven represents uh, the Satan or the Antichrist? It's a good question uh, because in Genesis 8 and 7, it says that the raven went to and fro. By the way, did you know Satan is found in the book of Job, chapter 1, verse 7, and God asked Satan, whence comest thou? And Satan said, from going to and fro in the earth. Again, that's Job 1 and 7. So there is a connection between that to and fro, not only with the raven, who, which, by the way, is an unclean bird, but also the Antichrist. So uh, after about 2,000 years, the Antichrist is let out, and uh, also the raven never comes back to Noah after he lets it out, right? Seven days later, Noah sends out a dove, and the dove comes back with nothing the first time, now, how many times is, is he going to send the dove out? 
He's going to send it out three times. Sends it out the first time, comes back with nothing, sends it out, waits seven days, uh, and sends the dove out again. This time the dove comes back with an olive branch in its mouth, which you're well familiar with. Noah waits another seven days, and he sends out the dove a third time. This time the dove doesn't return until Jesus is baptized in the Jordan River. And I'm in John chapter 1, verse 32. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 13 through 17, God gives Noah a sign in the sky. He will never destroy the earth again with a flood. Uh, that sign is a rainbow, and I th believe we've had a chance already to, to show, uh, talk about the rainbow. Um, but that is a sign that God will never destroy the earth by water again, right? However, uh, when you look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, it tells us the earth will be purified by fire. Uh, and I believe that will take place after the thousand-year millennial kingdom is over. Then the new Jerusalem, the city, comes down from heaven, and we live in the eternal state forever. Perhaps the earth gets the other half of the rainbow for a 360-degree rainbow uh, when that takes place. Just food for thought. So I hope you've been blessed with this Noah's Ark story. We all know that Jesus said uh, when he returns, it'll be like the days of Noah. I want to go to Matthew chapter 24 for a moment. Jesus refers to Noah's day because Noah and his family represented all the righteous on the earth at that particular time. In Genesis chapter 7, verse 1 through 4, the same instructions that God gave Noah just before the flood, I believe, gives us great insight into the sequence and end timing of the fire and destruction that will one day destroy a major part of the wicked earth. So, uh, here's a couple things I, I want to share with you. Uh, number one, the rapture of the church is revealed by the fact that Noah's family, the righteous, were lifted up above the earth before the flood destroyed life. Number two, the tribulation period and its length is revealed by the fact that the flood began the day Noah entered into safety and it took seven days for the flood to cover the earth representing I believe the Antichrist flight of, flight, uh, flood of de deception for seven years. Number three, the second advent is revealed in the fact that Noah came back to earth after the flood. Number four, the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ is revealed by the fact that Noah and his righteous family ruled the earth after their return. The purging, number five, the purging from the earth of all wickedness at the end of seven, the 7,000th year is revealed by the fact that after seven days, representing 7,000 years of human history, the judgment of God destroyed all the wicked from the earth. Well, Brother Mike, let me get my training aid. What's it all about? Well, this is what it's all about concerning the Noah's Ark story. You notice we go up above the destruction. Everybody that's in this boat. So the Lord shuts the door represents the rapture. The flood represents seven-year tribulation, type and shadow-wise. However, when the Ark does come back down eventually and people get off, only the righteous rule planet Earth. That's what I want you to get out of the story, and may you be blessed by that.